been handed to a protester is six months. The High Court has so far issued five injunctions banning road-blocking protests on the M25 around Dover Port and on major London roads. Insulate Britain activist Tracy Malahan spoke outside the Royal Courts of Justice after the sentencing criticising the government. Your government has now chosen to act and it's chosen to imprison us rather than meet the demand. By imprisoning us, the government shows its cowardice. They would rather lock up pensioners than insulate their homes. They would rather lock up teachers than create thousands of proper jobs. They would rather lock up young people than take practical steps to reduce our emissions. The cost of living has surged to its highest rate in almost 10 years. New data reveals that inflation rose to 4.2 per cent in October, mainly due to rising fuel and energy costs. The costs of transport, gas and electricity bills all climbed, meaning the consumer price index measure of inflation is now more than double the Bank of England's target. The bank has said it may have to increase interest rates in the coming months to tackle the problem. Arts, culture and heritage suffered a 60% decline in output due to the pandemic restrictions with a catastrophic effect on the lives of those involved. A Sheffield University study found that over half of jobs were furloughed in the sector, well above the national average of 16%. That's 450,000 people. The report said that activities including cinema, performing arts, museums and historical sites were the worst hit. Amazon will stop accepting Visa credit card payments in the UK from January of next year. The online retailer says it's due to the high fees Visa charges for processing credit card transactions. Customers will still be able to use debit cards, including Visa and non-Visa credit cards. The Queen has held her first official face-to-face -face engagement since missing the Remembrance Sunday service. She held an audience with General Sir Nick Carter, the Chief of the Defence Staff at Windsor Castle. The Queen, who's 95, had been following advice by doctors to rest. And the winners of the Guinness World Records Day 2021 have been revealed. Ashley Watson, a gymnast from Leeds, broke his own record when he completed a six-metre flip as part of the annual celebrations. Other winners include Tyler Phillips from the US, who won the most consecutive cars jumped over on a pogo stick, and Zhang Shuang from China, who secured the fastest time to pull a car 50 metres walking on his hands. You're right up to date, and I'll bring you the very latest headlines in about half an hour. Now back to De Piero and Halligan. Coming up on De Piero and Halligan today. We're debating the growing row of a sleaze which is engulfing Westminster as we ask, when is it OK for MPs to have a second job? And it's not just our guests we're going to hear from, of course, because... You're going to join the debate too. Email us gbviews at gbnews.uk or tweet us at gbnews. We'll be reading out some of your emails later in the show. Stay with us. So, welcome to the programme. Today we are debating that Westminster's lease candle, which is causing huge damage to the reputation of the House of Commons as the behaviour of MPs comes under growing scrutiny. Today, Parliament will debate whether MPs should be able to take a second job or not. The whole row started, of course, when former Tory MP Owen Paterson was found to have broken lobby lobbying rules as a paid consultant. Yesterday, the Prime Minister announced he wanted a ban on MPs accepting paid work as parliamentary advisers, strategists or consultants, saying it would stop MPs exploiting their positions. This came moments after Sir Keir Starmer had set out Labour's position, saying he would ban nearly all second jobs if he won power. While well, the Labour leader raised that issue of second jobs for MPs during Prime Minister's question time uh, just a couple of hours ago. Across the country and belatedly across this House, there is now agreement that Owen Paterson broke the rules and that the government should not have tried to let him off the hook. Many members opposite have apologised. The business secretary has apologised for his part. The leader of the House has apologised for his part. But they were following the Prime Minister's lead. So will he do the decent thing and just say sorry for trying to give the green light to corruption? Mr Speaker, yeah, well, yes, as I've said before, it certainly was a mistake uh, to conflate the case of an, an individual member 
no matter how sad with the point of principle at stake and we do need we do need a cross party approach on an appeals process we also need mr speaker a cross party approach on the way forward and that's why we've tabled the proposals that we have to take forward the report of the Independent uh, Committee for Standards in Public Life of 2018 uh, with those two key principles uh, that everybody in this House should focus primarily and above all on their job here in this House and secondly that no one should exploit their position in order to advance the commercial interests of anybody else. That's our position Mr Speaker. We want to take forward those reforms. In the meantime perhaps he could clear up from his proposals, uh, from his proposals, whether he would continue to be able to take money as he did from Mishcon Dorea and other legal firms. Oh, 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 order, order, Prime, Prime Minister, Prime Minister. As you know, and I do remind you, it's Prime Minister's questions, yeah. not Leader of the Opposition's questions. Keir Starmer. Yeah. That's not an apology. Everybody else, everybody else has apologised for him, but he won't apologise for himself. A coward, not a leader. Mm. OK, let's get this debate started. And joining us in the studio, we have Michael Fabricant, Conservative MP for Litchfield. Michael, nice to see you as ever. Where do you stand on the question of MPs having second paid jobs as well as being an MP? Well, I don't think there's anything wrong in having a second job providing it is a second job and not the main job, because you must be, first and foremost, a member of Parliament. But, having said that, I think if you've merely got a second job because you're a member of Parliament, so you've gone to a wealthy company and said, look, I can advise you how to get legislation through, I can advise you what the government's up to, I can even get you meetings with mm. senior ministers, yeah, yeah. that is wrong. However, when Keir Starmer, and there was nothing wrong with this in my view, when Keir Starmer became an MP, he was able to do it because he carried on doing legal work. That was the second job, but not related to his being prime... Well, he wasn't at that stage, not related to his being an MP. So that was fair dues, you think? I think it's fair dues. If you've got skills, you're, you're a doctor, a nurse, or some other thing which is not connected with Parliament, and you want to keep your hand in, not just for the money, but to know what the latest thoughts are in that area, I think it actually gives a benefit, providing that, as I say, you don't spend so much time on it, mm. it takes away from the day job. And the question is, how much time is too much time? <laughs> Sir Geoffrey Cox, who was Attorney General, uh, has registered almost £900,000 in the last year for around 1,000 hours of legal work. So he's not a paid, got a paid directorship or consultancy or lobby or any of those things. Mm. But he's, well, well is I, he spending too much time? I think, Gloria, I think a lot of people keep focusing on his £900,000 or whatever the figure is and the fact that he earned a lot of it in the British Virgin Islands when I was doing remote voting from Litchfield, which I think is far more glamorous, actually, than the Virgin Islands. Far Certainly better actually. weather. <laughs> Certainly better weather. You don't get hurricanes in Litchfield that often. Uh, I don't want to be, you know, a little bit too certain to say we don't get hurricanes, because I remember years ago when I was in Brighton when we did have a hurricane, and they said we wouldn't, but we're going off the point. <laughs> it, it, it's not so much what you earn, it's the hours that counts. And you asked me, Gloria, how many hours? I mean... I don't think we've decided yet in Parliament, and that's to be debated. My own view, it's got to be a darn sight less than 50% oh, yeah. of your working time. So, I don't know, 30%. I don't know whether that 1,000 hours, did you say it was? Was that over a year? In the last year. Yeah. I'd have to get my calculator out to ask you, you know... Oh, Liam will be able to work yeah, it out. Yeah, He's how, an economist. How many, God, quick, uh, a 1,000 hours now. a year, how many is that a week? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No idea. <laughs> Turns out Le well, Liam Halligan is not Carol Vorderman. Who are you? <laughs> well, That's 20 it, hours a week, isn't it? Well, that seems a lot. Me. Yeah. That seems yeah. a lot to me, you know. But would the rules, you see, are the, the, the rules that are going to be introduced, are they just, to, should they just focus on the paid directorships or lobbying consultancies, or should there be rules on the number of hours too? No, the most definitely should be on the number of hours. Right, too. okay. But actually, I mean, I brought along as a prop, because uh, it looks good on television, because you've you got go. the letter heading. Yeah, there there is. Downing Street. Which, which camera should yeah, I? There we it. are, there we yeah, are. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Downing Street. And he does actually say, uh, this is the letter that the Prime Minister wrote to uh, Lindsay Hoyle, the Speaker, and he said, 
activity outs outside un undertaken by an MP, whether remunerated or unremunerated, that's an interesting point, mm. by the way, should be within reasonable limits. But of course, that, yeah. Well, how long is a piece of string? Absolutely. But that's something we can decide in Parliament and should not prevent them from fully carrying out their range of duties, which means you've got to be there in the House of Commons. Mm. He said, speaking to you from the studio in The Point, which is not actually that close to the House of Commons. But... <laughs> not a million miles away. <laughs> we're, we're, we'll, we'll let you off, as long as you don't spend too much time in the studio. Yeah. Michael, what's the mood on the Tory backbenches? Uh, MPs I spoke to last night say there is um, concern, there is uh, discord, if you like. The Prime Minister has made uh, huge amounts of money as a writer, as an after-dinner speaker. You've got other jobbing MPs who don't command his huge speaking fees, who don't have his fame. Uh, he's seen, isn't he, to have made a bit of a mess of this well, issue, whipping MPs to do one yeah. thing and then you turn So, I speak to you as someone who was in the whip's office, yeah. both opposition and government, for seven years and before that, I hasten to add, Gloria, a, a shadow DTI spokesman. And one thing I learned is you whip house business as opposed to government business at your peril. What do I mean by that? Government business is when you're passing yeah. government legislation. Yeah. And often there's a manifesto commitment to yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. And house business is all about, you know, how the house runs itself. Yeah. And if you start whipping that, there'll be troubles. And boy, were there troubles this time. And um, Boris accepts it. In fact, it's interesting. I can reveal tonight. I'll probably be thrown out of the house. This lunchtime. I could reveal. <laughs> yeah, sorry. This lunchtime. You see, we do such long hours. I could, oh, I could get, reveal it because reveal we want to bring Graham Stringer in. Yeah, oh, all right. Okay. Yeah. Right. Well, <laughs> <laughs> you didn't tell me there was a time limit. <laughs> <laughs> that uh, Boris will be addressing the 1922 oh, no, tonight yes, oh, at five o'clock. Oh. That's all Tory MPs. Just to explain to our viewers. Yep. And there's going to be some grumpy ones. There may be, there may not be. Often it's one? a huge anti climax. You... No, actually, yeah, you know. No, 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 okay, you're right, you're right. We need to... I love Boris. <laughs> Michael Fabricant, because I was MP for Litchfield. God, I never thought he'd shut up. He's going <laughs> to stay with us. He's going to stay with us. <laughs> but for now, we can cross to our next guest, Graham Stringer, the Labour MP for Blackley and Broughton. Graham, good to see you. Is being an MP a full time job? Uh, more than sometimes. Uh, I mean, what worries me about. Some of the talk about what percentage you can do, what number of hours you can do. It's a job, uh, as you know, with ultimate flexibility, and it should have ultimate flexibility. If you feel you need to be in your constituency because there is flooding or some other emergency, well, you, that's your judgment. You need to be in your constituency. Sometimes you need to be elsewhere in the country because there are uh, things as an MP that you, you need to do. Sometimes you need to be in the Commons Chamber. And I think those judgments, how much time you spend where you are, are the essence of the freedom given to us uh, when we have the privilege of being elected to the Commons. My, I, I will vote for the Labour motion uh, this afternoon. But my worry is we're getting into dangerous dogs territory, i.e. there is a knee-jerk action. Uh, Owen Patterson uh, was uh, voted in favour of and then voted against. Uh, and everybody is worried and panicking about it. And we need to step back and make sure uh, we get it right. And we don't pass an act like the Dangerous Dogs Act, which has never been effective, but it was done after a a little girl was savaged by, by dogs. A keen nose for public opinion. This doesn't look good for Parliament, does it? It's unedifying. And some voters might even say it's introspective to spend all this time squabbling over second jobs. For instance, why aren't MPs discussing how we respond to that terrible suicide bombing attempt on Remembrance Sunday? Why aren't MPs discussing how we tackle the ongoing migrant crisis with numbers of people crossing the channel in small boats now, spiralling. Couldn't agree with you more. Uh, the COVID ep epidemic is uh, still continuing. There are uh, people who need to be vaccinated who aren't vaccinated. Uh, there are problems with people coming into the country uh, who shouldn't be allowed into to the country. There are even not things as important as that. There are small uh, 
crime nuisance on the streets, which annoys my constituents, and I guess it will annoy Michael uh, Fabrigan's constituents a lot. And those are the things that we should uh, be focusing on. I mean, <laughs> China is uh, rattling its sabers, as is uh, Russia. There is uh, inflation is on the march. There are a huge number, I could go on for the rest of the afternoon, there are a huge number of important issues, uh, MPs regulating themselves or agreeing to a regulator uh, is something that should have been done a long time ago. And it is very introspective. We should be talking about important things and trying to make the law better and pe so that people are safer and the economy works more efficiently. I thought you made a really interesting point there, Graham, about not uh, rushing legislation, because there is a perfectly well made point to make, which is that the existing rules work. Owen Patterson was found in breach of the rules. Absolutely. He was suspended. Yeah. And this whole hoo-ha has yeah. only arisen because the government party managers tried to unsuspend him and throw out the independent um, verdict on his behaviour. Do you think we're in danger of uh, stopping people being, I don't know, giving after-dinner speeches or... Uh, presenting a radio show, writing newspaper columns? Yeah, I, I think there is a, a real worry. And one of the... It's not working in a hospital, which everybody agrees is a good thing. If you're a doctor or a nurse, giving your time, everybody would agree being a reservist in the arms uh, uh, forces is a good thing. And if you get called into active service, that's... Uh, people would support it. But what about a small business? Uh, Two people, three people uh, run a family uh, shop. And should uh, an MP who goes back to their own business, should they not work behind the counter in that shop? It's a complicated area. And whether it's working in a shop or a hospital or even being a lawyer, and we all, lawyers are not very the most popular people in the world, you're also getting experience of the outside world when you do that. I mean, one of, another privilege that MPs have, we go into factories, schools, universities, we meet people, talk to people, and we learn about what's going on. Sometimes uh, doing a job where you meet customers in a shop, where you meet patients in a hospital, you learn things that you wouldn't otherwise learn. You make the point, Gloria, that it can be a very insular activity if you spend all your time in the, in the House of Commons, worthy as that may sound if you tot up the hours, but you are limiting your experience of what your constituents are uh, uh, having to put up with on a day-to-day -day basis. Graham Stringer, Labour MP for Blackley and Broughton. Uh, thanks, as ever, for your time. Michael Fabricant, you're still here. I'm still here. <laughs> I was listening to Graham, and I, and I agreed with every word he said. Well, I'm going to pick up Gloria on some things. You made it actually a factual error. <laughs> oh, oh. As many journalists have made. Oh. When oh. we voted... Oh, indeed, this is GB News could lose its licence. No, no. <laughs> but you said that we voted to actually overturn the decision. Well, you did. We, we did not. <laughs> what we voted... You voted to well, set up... A, OK, sorry. Yeah. We can have a Let row. You can, you can... Let me have a word. Yes. This is far more interesting. <laughs> Imagine <laughs> presenting with her. <laughs> exactly. What we voted for was we thought the procedure, and I won't go into it now because that will be a bit boring, was seriously flawed by the way he was judged. <laughs> so we were setting up a committee. We were not changing the rules. What we were going to do was set up a committee to look at actually the way we would not oh, have come a on. judge. Jacob Rees Mogg has said this, you should way. never have combined those two, no, two I votes agree with in you one. On that. So and that's that, so that, that was we should. Exactly. But he wouldn't have got off because, in my view, all that would have happened, it would have delayed the inevitable by about four months. So trying to get him off was not the point. A lot of people, people would, including Charles that. Moore and various others who wrote in the Telegraph, explained why it was so badly handled, the inquiry, and that was the problem. And that's why I voted for it before I even knew it was being whipped, which was the big mistake. It shouldn't have been whipped. Michael Fabrican, MP for Lichfield. <laughs> Thank you very much You'll for joining us. You'll never back on again. Oh, you are welcome, welcome any time. <laughs> you are welcome any time. He's practically moved in. Crikey. <laughs> <laughs> We've heard what some of our guests think. We've heard in particular what one guest thinks. He thinks um, I'm wrong. I mean, yeah. it's outrageous. I'm not having that story. <laughs> back off. Uh, but we want to know, of course, what you think about our big debate today. Should MPs have second jobs or not? You can email in to share your views on gbviews at gbnews.uk.
We've also started a poll on this over on the GB News Twitter page. Should MPs be allowed to have a second job? You can add your vote via at GB News. Up next, nine insulate Britain protesters have been jailed for blocking roads. We'll have the details, but just before that, it's time for your weather. It's time to remind ourselves there's always another winter. Canary Islands sponsors the weather. Hello again. For much of the UK, it's a much brighter day. Now, there are some showers around, particularly across the northwest, and they'll keep going in Western Scotland through the rest of the day. But elsewhere, high pressure is toppling in. We've had a cold front crossing the country. That's brought the brighter skies and also bringing a slightly fresher feel. Notice the isobars fairly close together across the northern half of the UK, so it is breezy here. There are a few showers over northwest England, but they're fading away. Most of the showers will be across central and western Scotland through the rest of the day. And even here, they'll tend to ease off a little later. Clouding over for Northern Ireland, but for the bulk of England and Wales, dry and bright with sunny spells. And temperatures, uh, although not as high as recent days, still a little bit above average, particularly in the south. We could squeak up to 13 Celsius. Through this evening, we'll see some drizzly conditions push through Northern Ireland. And, uh, and the rain peps up overnight across western and northern Scotland, turning into quite a soggy night here. The wind's also continuing to strengthen. Further south, we'll have a lot of clouds, maybe a bit of drizzle over the hills of northwest England, but otherwise largely dry and uh, temperatures dropping down to single figures, but not especially cold. In fact, things turning milder steadily through Thursday morning. The cloud will be back for most of us, though. Some sunshine is likely across eastern England, but generally another fairly drab day. Rain and drizzle over the hills of Wales, northwest England, and quite a wet day across the north and west of Scotland. But some brighter skies in eastern Scotland, although it will be blustery, could see temperatures of 15, maybe 16 Celsius, and generally 13 or 14, well above average for the time of year. Through Thursday evening, we'll keep outbreaks of rain and drizzle over the highlands, easing perhaps for a time across the Northern Isles, but staying blustery across the far north. Elsewhere, staying predominantly cloudy, and that's how we go into Friday. Again, some brightness likely across parts of the east, and again, it will be breezy. Things turn colder as we go through the weekend. Canary Islands sponsors the weather. Join me, Alex Phillips, for the Afternoon Agenda on GB News, Monday to Thursday from 4pm till 6pm. We don't lecture to you or try to tell you what to think. We do a deep delve into a topic with views from across the range of debate, therefore leaving you, the viewer, to make up your own mind. Join me, Alex Phillips, for the Afternoon Agenda on GB News, 4 till 6, Monday to Thursday. You're watching GB News live across the UK and the world on our digital stream. GB News is Britain's news channel. We are the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. We are here for you. Don't forget to join our YouTube community by clicking on that subscribe button. And if you want the GB News app, you can click and catch up on programmes anytime. We love to hear from you, so email us. GBviews at gbnews.uk Thanks for being part of the GB News family. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7pm for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panellists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate. And I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. I'm Colin Brazier. I've reported from more than 70 countries around the world, covered wars from Afghanistan to Iraq, from Lebanon to the Balkans. I'm trying to bring that experience, that feel for events, to the studio. And something else, I'm ready to give an opinion. Today's stories with a spark. Brazier from 8 p.m. weekdays on GB News.
Welcome back. Remember, there's still time to give us your opinion on our debate. When is it right for MPs to have a second job? Is it ever right? Get in touch with your view. Email gbviews at gbnews.uk or tweet us at gbnews. Now, nine Insulate Britain activists have been jailed at the High Court for breaching an injunction designed to prevent the group from blocking roads as a form of protest. Our Home and Security Editor Mark White was in court and joins us now. Is it going to act as a deterrent? It's a sentence, it's a jail sentence. Well, ultimately it might, but certainly publicly it doesn't appear so from what Insulate Britain are saying. They're as determined as ever to go out and continue to block the roads. I think the judges were left with no choice, really. It was a surprise that they were jailed, but when you heard these activists in court addressing the judge and giving evidence and saying that, look, we are going to continue this protest, they believe they got right on their side in terms of the way the climate is being affected and the need to properly insulate homes. Uh, so they think they're doing the right thing and they are willing, they say, to go to prison. And they were saying quite blatantly to the judges, if you don't lock us up, then, yeah, we're going to go right out there and we're going to continue to block roads again. So bearing that in mind and the aggravating factors, uh, this was a protest specifically on the 8th of October on the M25, Junction 25, mm. early in the morning in the rush hour. Mm. Uh, the judges said, look, that protest didn't just cause disruption, it put members of the public at risk and it also put members of the police service attending and dealing with this at risk as well. You've been unrepentant uh, and you are expressing a determination to go off and do this again. A custodial threshold has been passed. It won't be suspended. And we're jailing the nine people from between three and six months. This is what Insulate Britain said on the steps of the High Court just afterwards. Over the last nine weeks, 174 ordinary people have held our government to account, asking that they deliver on the most basic of their duties, and that is to protect the British people, the economy and all we hold dear for our society. Your government has now chosen to act and it's chosen to imprison us rather than meet the demand. By imprisoning us, the government shows its cowardice. They would rather lock up pensioners than insulate their homes. They would rather lock up teachers than create thousands of proper jobs. They would rather lock up young people than take practical steps to reduce our emissions. They will lock us up and leave thousands to die in the cold this winter. We knew we would face prison when we took this action, but we cannot stand by while this government betrays the general public. Following the widely recognised failure of our government at COP26, we are continuing to ask them to get on with the job of cutting carbon, emis carbon emissions, of insulating cold and leaky houses, of protecting the people of this country from climate collapse because the lives of our children and those of all future ge generations hang in the balance. To the government, we say you can't imprison a flood. There are no unlimited fines against a famine. You can't bankrupt a fire. To the public, we say no one is going to save you. In the past, when governments have failed to protect their people, the right thing to do is to highlight the injustice, breaking the law if needed. This is what the suffragettes and Martin Luther King did, and it is what Insulate in Britain has done. Insulate Britain defiant there, Mark. It strikes me that this custodial sentence sets a benchmark, a minimum, if you like. Do you think this may now... Uh, lead to jail sentences for other people that protest and crucially for motorists do you think it will mean the police will be they won't mess about they won't w wait and negotiate with insulate britain people for two or three hours as everyone sits there or just be pick them up off the road i think to be fair to the police they they are have been uh, trying to move in as quickly as they can to to arrest people and get them out of the road but they can't just do it with a handful of officers initially. They need to get enough officers in place to put a containment round the protesters on the ground so that you know they don't get up and run into the, the path of an oncoming lorry, yeah, for instance. Yeah, so yeah. they've got to do it safely. That's yeah. why it takes a bit of time. And, of course, they glue their hands to the roadway, yeah. and that needs to be uh, dealt with and put these dissolving agents in to try and release their hand without hurting them. Anyway, to get back to the point... Okay. about this precedent being set. You're absolutely right. I think there is no way that a judge now, having looked at the sentence that's being passed, 
can get the next lot. And we've got 23 more protesters in the coming weeks who are due up for breaching those injunctions. Uh, you can't say to them, oh, well, they were jailed, but we'll let you off with a fine. The precedent has been set. And there are dozens and dozens of insulate Britain protesters who have broken these roads and junctions in recent weeks uh, who will potentially now be facing jail term. Mark White, as ever, our Home Affairs and Security Editor, thanks a lot for that update on Insulate Britain. Right after this break, it's all about your opinion. Join the debate next on De Piero and Halligan. But first, it is time for the news headlines with Simon Pusey. Thank you, guys. I am Simon Pusey. Here are your latest headlines. Boris Johnson clashed with Labour leader Sir Keir Starmer ahead of a showdown with his own MPs over plans to ban them from paid political consultancy work. The Prime Minister says he supports a ban but has called for two alterations. The first would put reasonable limits on MPs' outside work. The second would bar MPs from being paid to be a parliamentary strategist, advisor or consultant. Labour claims the government has watered down its own proposals, effectively making the ban non Finding. Police have confirmed the Liverpool bomber began making purchases in April for Sunday's attack outside a maternity hospital. Emad al Sway Almin was born in Iraq and officers say he had episodes of mental illness. The Home Secretary, Priti Patel, says Britain's dysfunctional asylum system meant he was able to remain in the country after his application was rejected. Nine Insulate Britain activists have been jailed for breaching a High Court injunction that prevents the group's road blockages. The maximum sentence that's been handed to a protester is six months. The High Court has so far issued five injunctions banning road blocking protests on the M25, around Dover Port and on major London roads. A woman has died in a once-in-a-century storm in Canada. Rescuers in Vancouver say at least two others are missing after heavy rain caused a landslide. Farmers are using boats and even jet skis to rescue animals from flooded areas. The Queen has held her first official face-to-face -face engagement since missing the Remembrance Sunday service. She held an audience with General Sir Nick Carter, the Chief of the Defence Staff at Windsor Castle. That's it from me. I'll have a full update for you on today's main stories at the top of the hour. You're watching GB News live across the UK and the world on our digital stream. GB News is Britain's news channel. We are the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. We are here for you. Don't forget to join our YouTube community by clicking on that subscribe button. And if you want the GB News app, you can click and catch up on programmes anytime. We love to hear from you, so email us. GBviews at gbnews.uk Thanks for being part of the GB News family. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics <laughs> because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate. And I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilized conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. I'm Colin Brazier. I've reported from more than 70 countries around the world, covered wars from Afghanistan to Iraq, from Lebanon to the Balkans. I'm trying to bring that experience, that feel for events, to the studio. And something else, I'm ready to give an opinion. Today's stories with a spark. Brazier from 8 p.m. weekdays on GB News. Welcome back today. We're debating MPs' second jobs. Been debating that. It's been engulfing Westminster now for a couple of weeks, hasn't it? As the behaviour of MPs comes under growing scrutiny, we're asking, when is it OK, if ever, for an MP to have a second job? 
It's worth noting that over 200 MPs have received earnings in, over the last year on top of their annual salary, and that salary is already almost £82,000. The extra earnings range from £50 a year to almost a million. Joining us now to continue this discussion is the MP for Western Supermare and the Prime Minister's anti-corruption champion, John Penrose. John, with the best will in the world, hasn't the Prime Minister made a bit of a mess of this situation, whipping his MPs on a point of parliamentary procedure as opposed to uh, government policy, and then doing a U-turn? Well, Liam, you're absolutely right to say that um, both other ministers and indeed the Prime Minister have said that uh, he didn't think it, it, the, that he, it, it didn't work um, well at all and that mistakes have been made. So yeah, no argument there. I think that there is a, a um, you know, widespread recognition that uh, the, the two questions which we were all trying to deal with, one is the general point about how you improve the overall system to make to clean up politics, um, needs to be kept separate from individual cases. In this case, it was Owen Patterson, but it could be the as well. So it's really important to keep the two separate. And I'm really hoping that today's debate and, and you know, from now on, we're going to be able to achieve that and to make sure that we are genuinely trying to tighten up the rules, which I think is absolutely essential. What second jobs do you think should be allowed, if any? Well, Gloria, I mean, I, the, the point is, of course, that uh, you will know, as a former MP yourself, every, every single minister technically is a second job. I mean, if you're a minister of the Crown, you get a second salary, you get a second pension scheme. So it's not that every single second job is automatically evil or bad or wrong. Some of them are really, really essential and vital and part of the way our country and our democracy works. But the question is, I think, twofold. Uh, one is, does your second job mean that your constituents are getting shortchanged? If it's a little bit of extra, and a lot of people do everything from, you know, um, being a um, being a, a, a sports referee for their local uh, local um, community sports club on a Saturday, no problem with anything like that, um, through to some really big jobs. So at what point do you cross the line and start making your constituents getting second best and not getting their full money's worth for, for someone who's supposed to be there to stick up for them in Parliament? And the second question is, if you do have a small second role, does it in any way create a conflict of interest which stops you doing the job in Parliament and creates some sort of uh, you know, difficulty with doing it honestly and fairly and in the best interests of your constituents and the country as a whole? John Penrose, I'm going to ask you the same question that I asked Labour's Graham Stringer earlier in our show. This looks very introspective. It looks very Westminster-centric. The public's worried about lots of things at the moment, whether or not we're going to go back to lockdown, spiralling cost of living crisis, the migrant scandal, how we respond to a suicide bombing attempt in Liverpool on Remembrance Sunday, and yet you lot are squabbling about second jobs. But you're absolutely right that the problem here is that it, it undermines faith in democracy if people can't be confident that their democracy is clean and that it's working properly. But the only reason for having a properly working and clean democracy is so that it can address the really important and crucial upfront issues which you've just been listing. So it's one of these things which I think we've got to get fixed and fixed quickly and then move on from as fast as we can so that we can get on to the, to the, the stuff which is urgent and really important on everything from Brexit on through. Do you think that you might formally set the number of hours which it's acceptable to work on a second job. Obviously, we're not talking about the paid consultancies. It looks to me, please correct me if I'm wrong, like they will be gone um, and they, they, they will be banned. But do you need... So Geoffrey Cox, for example, he, he wasn't a consultant or um, working for a lobbyist. He was... Uh, but he has earned almost £900,000 in the last year for around 1,000 hours of legal work. Now, do you think you have to formally say you can't do more than... X number of hours per year, per week. Do you have to be that strict? I, I think that the moment you start to draw a line, um, the danger is that you know, some people will do... If the question is how much you're doing for your constituents, not how much you're doing for other people. Um, in, in principle, there's a maximum number of hours in the week, so at some point those two are going to sort of conflict with each other. But actually, if you've got someone who's already working you know, six days a week flat out for their constituents, and then they do something on Sunday mornings, paid or unpaid... I don't think anyone's going to reckon that their constituents are getting um, you know, shortchanged in some way. 
So I think the question is much more about how much do your constituents think that you are paying attention to them? How, you, how well are you doing the job for them? Are you doing enough for them rather than what are you doing for other people? And, and as I obviously that one will affect the other in the end, but providing you enough for your constituents, I, I'd phrase it that way around. I think that's the crucial question. Geoffrey Cox, though, did a 1,000 hours in a year. Gloria asked me on live television how many hours that is a week. I said it's about 20. Actually, it's 19.23. <laughs> well, that, that only took you half an hour to... <laughs> I said 20. Can't get the stuff. I said 20. <laughs> <laughs> a normal working week is 40 hours, John. I know a lot of MPs work much longer hours than that, of course. You know, I, I know that. But to an ordinary person, 20 hours a week mm. is a half-time job. Isn't that too much? We're not talking about the fact that the guy's a world-class lawyer, which he is, fair enough. We're not talking about the fact mm. that he needs to keep his legal practice going because he's spent most of his life studying and building up that expertise. All that being a top lawyer doesn't help him to be a better MP or minister or whatever it is. We're talking about 20 hours a week. That's a lot of time. It is, but again, I go back to the point I made earlier about ministers. So most ministers um, will be spending at least 20 hours a week being ministers. I mean, in fact, if you're you know, the prime minister, is probably spending, you know, goodness knows how many hours a week, 60 hours a week, I don't know, being the prime minister. That's a second job, um, and nobody argues that that's in any way wrong, um, but it does mean that you've got to make sure that you are also paying enough attention to your constituents at the same time so that they know that they're getting their money's worth. And, you know, the, the people of Geoffrey Cox's constituency will have formed a view on Jeffrey long ago about whether or not they think he's um, doing the job for them. They keep on electing him, so I presume they, they have up until now and um, completely agree with that. But I think we've just got to be careful about saying um, if you're doing more than X hours for somebody else, you can't be doing the job properly because, as I said, um, pretty soon most ministers would, would fall foul of that as well. John Penrose, Conservative MP for Western Supermare and the Prime Minister's anti-corruption champion. Thanks a lot for joining us on GB News. Joining us now is the Liberal Democrat MP for Edinburgh West, Christine Jardine. Uh, your leader, Christine, nice to see you, by the way, as always, but your, your leader Hello. earns an extra £78,000 a year uh, advising an international law firm and an energy firm. Might that be banned? Should that be banned? Well, actually, since um, this um, controversy came to light, Ed has looked at it again and looked at the fact that he was within the rules. He wasn't doing anything wrong. He was uh, working to um, supplement, look after his severely disabled son, and that's why he was doing it. But in the light of um, everything that has happened over the last couple of weeks, Ed thought, you know, we have to look at this again. We have to reconsider. And so that's precisely what he has done. Now, a lot of us have been doing that. We've been looking at, you know, a register of members interest thinking, I mean, I don't have a, a second job, but a lot of people have been doing that. And Ed just decided that, you know, in the light of everything that's happened, you know, he would think again and find a different way of doing it. So that's no longer as I understand it, the position. Christine, uh, is it right that somebody should lead a party, be involved in legislation that involves the tech giants, uh, and then go and work for Facebook? I mean, if you're an MP, surely, you know, even after you've left the House of Commons, left ministerial office, the public's still concerned that the prospect of a cushy, well-remunerated job after your political career may make you act differently within your political career. So shouldn't the rules extend beyond your life as an MP? The rules do extend beyond when you leave uh, government, specifically. Um, you are precluded from a certain amount of time of doing things. Special advisors can't work for um, other people for, for two years. They can't work within certain areas. There are rules there, but to suggest that once you've left parliament, you shouldn't have a job in an area where you have developed expertise is, to me, that's almost as strange as John Penrose having suggested that being a minister is a second job, which is the most ludicrous thing I have heard in quite some time. Um, so I think we have to be realistic about this debate. What we are talking specifically about is whether elected representatives like myself and everybody else in the House of Commons should make that the first and only job 
or whether they should have some other call in their time. And to compare someone going to work for Facebook after they've left the House of Commons with Geoffrey Cox representing a tax haven against the UK government to prevent the taxpayers in this country getting money from that tax haven to work against the government of which he is part is ludicrous. That is what is wrong. That is what we have to stamp out. And this has all come about because Boris Johnson tried to rig the system because he didn't like a judgment against one of his members of parliament who was judged to have um, committed an egregious breach of the rules. That's what this is about. And that's what we need to fix. On the issue of Geoffrey Cox, because you, you, you specifically mentioned um, his work all in the British Virgin Islands uh, to advise on a corruption inquiry. Is, is, is your objection to Jeff, Geoffrey Cox, therefore, who earned £900,000 in the last year for about 1,000 hours of legal work, is it the fact that he spent his time advising the British Virgin Islands? Is, is it the issue that you didn't like him working on or is it the fact that he spent 1,000 hours doing legal work? It's both. I mean, how anyone finds a thousand hours um, when they're an MP to work in something else, I find astonishing. I couldn't find, you know, a hundred hours. They made a thousand hours. I couldn't find ten, I don't think. You know, just living life away from here sometimes is a challenge, as I'm sure you know. So the fact that someone could give a thousand hours of the time that, they, you know, they should be giving to the constituency, being paid for it, being, you know, and also on this specific issue, I find unacceptable. We need to look again at the rules, but we need an independent look at the rules. We need an independent advisor to say, this is not acceptable. That's who should judge, not me, but someone independent. Thank me for being unrealistic, uh, Christine Jardine, with all respect, but I want to return to this idea of what MPs well, and ministers and even deputy prime ministers <laughs> do when they leave office. Right. Um, it won't have escaped you. There's a whole literature of <laughs> governance across the Western world about so-called revolving doors, what people mm -hmm. do when they leave yep. office and whether it implicates them and affects their uh, behaviour when they're in office. So I'm not being unrealistic at all. And I put it to you that the coalition government, many senior members of the coalition government, from special advisers right the way through to the deputy prime minister, have gone to work for the tech giants and there is a big body of opinion out there, not all of it unrealistic remotely, that is concerned that ministers, special advisers, government members are soft peddling on regulating the tech giants because they know when they leave office they'll get a cushy job. Well, what about, I, I understand what you're saying, and one of the most, for me, astonishing examples was David Cameron, who um, was lobbying um, allegedly ministers. Um, and we saw the whole green cell controversy. Now, that is an issue, and that is something that we have to look at. And we do have to be careful about why people are in Parliament and, and what they're doing and you know what they're doing afterwards. But we also have to be very careful that we don't prevent them having lives afterwards. Um, you know, I probably, well, you know, won't be um, an MP until the end of, of my life. So, yes, I accept that, um, and I accepted when I was a special advisor, yes, I accept that there are limits on when and what I can do afterwards. But I also think that you cannot preclude people completely from moving into other careers once they leave Westminster. Then you start to undermine our ability to attract people of talent and skill to the career. And I'm sure that's not what anybody wants in this. But we do have to look at the system which has been consistently brought into question over the past two years by the behaviour of this government and um, lobbying and you know, previous members of this government. So we have to look at that and we have to have an independent assessor to look at it. We shouldn't be marking our own homework. But what we have to do is get to grips with this system and make sure we've got it fixed. And we've also got this ludicrous situation now where you mentioned it yourself. We have the Prime Minister doing yet another U-turn. How is backbenchers are keeping up with what he is saying and what he is doing? I, you know, 
I, I don't Christine envy Jardine. them. And they seem to have forgotten the advice from Margaret Thatcher about U-turns. She once famously said, U-turn if you want to, the lady's not for turning well. Christine I dread to Jardine, Lib Dem MP for now. Edinburgh West. Thanks a lot for Thank you. Joining Thank you. We're just running out of time, but GB we're News. grateful for your time. No uh, let's get more on this with our next guest, senior political commentator for The Independent, John Rental. Hi, John. Always good to see you. Hi there. Uh, Keir Starmer branded Boris Johnson a coward who defends corruption. I mean, defending corruption, that's a bit OTT, isn't it, on this? Well, he was. Uh, he had to withdraw the term coward. Uh, he said uh, Boris Johnson was a coward, not a leader. Uh, coward turns out to be an unparliamentary term, so uh, I guess I had to withdraw it. Uh, both leaders uh, used unparliamentary language because... Uh, uh, Boris Johnson made much of uh, uh, Keir Starmer's misconduct, which was a very clever play on words uh, because Keir Starmer used to work, uh, do some work for a company called Mishkondorea. Um, it was all quite silly, but uh, Keir Starmer actually, I think, uh, got the better of it because he was trying to establish that this is really a problem created by the Prime Minister and it's a problem mostly uh, on the Prime Minister's side of the House of Commons. Time. How much damage is this doing the government, this so-called sleaze scandal? We've seen a few polls putting Labour ahead for the first time in a while. Is that a trend? Uh, yes, it is. It's, it's clearly a trend. How much the, uh, uh, the, the sort of second jobs issue contributes to that, we can't really tell, because there's a lot of other things going on at the same time. The government put up taxes, the NHS is in a terrible state. Uh, and there's a rather visible problem uh, of immigration that the government hasn't got, uh, got a grip on. So, you know, there's lots of things uh, that might explain why the, why the government's not so popular. Uh, but this certainly doesn't help. And the whole point of Keir Starmer's attack today was to establish that it's more of a, of a Conservative Party problem than a Labour Party problem. And of course, the Prime Minister was trying to fight back by... Uh, by pointing to the legal work that Keir Starmer used to do before he was leader, but uh, that's all in the past. But Labour really have much, much more to do. They can't sit back and rely on this lease candle and expect to just end up in government because of the uh, failings, temporary or otherwise, of the current lot. Yeah, no, I mean that's it's it's not going to it's not going to decide the next election certainly, but it has it has done some damage. Uh, I mean the Prime Minister. Uh, tried to limit the damage by doing a U-turn as quickly as he, as he could. But, I mean, he made the mistake in the first place, and that's just classic uh, Boris Johnson. Uh, his, uh, his first instinct was, was to do the wrong thing, to try to, uh, to try intimidate the, uh, the independent uh, standards commissioner. Um, I think that was, that was the prime minister's real motive. Uh, I don't think he was trying to get a, a fellow MP off the hook particularly because uh, he cast Owen Paston out of the outer darkness as soon as, uh, as, as he realised his mistake. I think the Prime Minister doesn't like the way that an independent standards uh, body is going to hold him to account, and I think that's very damning. That's damning for him. John, we've got to leave it there. John Rental, senior political commentator at The Independent, as ever. Great to have you with us. You've been emailing us your opinion. Anthony says, we pay them good money to be MPs. They get plenty of generous perks with it. Mm, exactly. MPs should have one job and one job only to make life better for the people who voted them in. Chris says, if it doesn't affect their work as an MP, then I generally don't see why it's so terrible. It's not like the expense of scandal. Ray emailed us to say, yes, there is nothing wrong with a secondary job as long as it doesn't conflict with the public service job. Mm. Michael says, if you have a second job, you're not giving 100% in your main job of MP. Trudy says, if they do... Good, they get voted back in. If they do bad, they get voted out. How many other jobs they have should not matter. Mm, interesting. You've been voting Good range on of our... views. Yeah, Good range of views. You've been voting on our Twitter poll. Let's have a look. Six... Go on. <laughs> 61% <laughs> said no to should MPs be allowed to have a second job. Well, 39% of you said yes, it's fine for Higher MPs to have a second job. Job. Interesting. Three fifths, two fifths split, or maybe my maths is a bit tricky. <laughs> You've as been watching. Ever. <laughs> the Piero and Halligan on GB News. We are back tomorrow at two. I'm back at midday. Well, He's I'll, back where I'll be setting Gloria random sums on live television. <laughs> <laughs> Coming up.
It's the PM briefing with Darren McCaffrey, GB News' political editor, keeping you up to date with all the daily politics. Thanks for joining He's us. He's not the PM. It's just the, the, the afternoon briefing, we should call it. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> Whoa, it's me. It's the weather. It's time to remind ourselves there's always another winter. Canary Islands sponsors the weather. Hello again. For much of the UK, it's a much brighter day. Now, there are some showers around, particularly across the northwest, and they'll keep going in western Scotland through the rest of the day. But elsewhere, high pressure is toppling in. We've had a cold front crossing the country. That's brought the brighter skies and also bringing a slightly fresher feel. Notice the isobars fairly close together across the northern half of the UK, so it is breezy here. There are a few showers over northwest England, but they're fading away. Most of the showers will be across central and western Scotland through the rest of the day. And even here, they'll tend to ease off a little later. Clouding over for Northern Ireland, but for the bulk of England and Wales, dry and bright with sunny spells. And temperatures, uh, although not as high as recent days, still a little bit above average, particularly in the south. We could squeak up to 13 Celsius. Through this evening, we'll see some drizzly conditions push through Northern Ireland. And... Uh, and the rain peps up overnight across western and northern Scotland, turning into quite a soggy night here. The winds are also continuing to strengthen. Further south, we'll have a lot of clouds, maybe a bit of drizzle over the hills of northwest England, but otherwise largely dry and uh, temperatures dropping down to single figures, but not especially cold. In fact, things turning milder steadily through Thursday morning. The cloud will be back for most of us, though. Some sunshine is likely across eastern England, but generally another fairly drab day. Rain and drizzle over the hills of Wales, northwest England, and quite a wet day across the north and west of Scotland. But some brighter skies in eastern Scotland, although it will be blustery, could see temperatures of 15, maybe 16 Celsius, and generally 13 or 14, well above average for the time of year. Through Thursday evening, we'll keep outbreaks of rain and drizzle over the highlands, easing perhaps for a time across the northern Isles, but staying blustery across the far north. Elsewhere, staying predominantly cloudy, and that's how we go into Friday. Again, some brightness likely across parts of the east, and again, it will be breezy. Things turn colder as we go through the weekend. Canary Islands sponsors the weather. You're watching GB News live across the UK and the world on our digital stream. GB News is Britain's news channel. We are the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. We are here for you. Don't forget to join our YouTube community by clicking on that subscribe button. And if you want the GB News app, you can click and catch up on programmes anytime. We love to hear from you, so email us. GBviews at gbnews.uk Thanks for being part of the GB News family. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate. And I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. around the world covered wars from Afghanistan to Iraq, from Lebanon to the Balkans. I'm trying to bring that experience that to the studio. And something else, I'm ready to give an opinion. Today's stories with a spark. Brazier from 8 p.m. weekdays on GB News. Uh, very good afternoon. Welcome to The Briefing PM with me, Darren McCaffrey. We're going to be going to live to Parliament in just a couple of moments' time where the Prime Minister is facing a grilling by MPs, senior MPs, on things like standards in the Commons, violence against women, COP26 
and the recent budget spending. Given PMQs, it looks like it could be quite spicy. We'll have full, continuous coverage from the Commons in just a couple of moments. But first, with the time, just after three, let's get you up to date with the latest news this hour with Simon. Hello, I'm Simon Pusey. This is your news at three o'clock. Boris Johnson has clashed with Labour leader Sir Keir Starmer ahead of a showdown with his own MPs over plans to ban them from paid political consultancy work. The Prime Minister supports the ban but has called for two alterations. The first would put reasonable limits on MPs outside work. The second would bar MPs from being paid to be a parliamentary strategist advisor or consultant. Labour claims the government had watered down its own proposals, effectively making the ban non-binding. Speaking at Prime Minister's questions earlier, Sir Keir Starmer accused Boris Johnson of being unable to apologise for the Owen Patson scandal. When somebody in my party misbehaves, I kick them out. When somebody in his party misbehaves, he tries to get them off the hook. Yeah. I... A bomb disposal vehicle has arrived near to Sutcliffe Street, one of the addresses used by the Liverpool bomber Emad al Sway al -Min. Police have also extended a cordon around the property as they investigate materials they have found inside. Counter-terror police say he had been planning his attack since April. He blew himself up in a taxi outside a maternity hospital on Sunday. The taxi has now been removed from the site of the blast. Officers say the 32-year-old was born in Iraq and had episodes of mental illness. The Home Secretary, Priti Patel, says Britain's dysfunctional asylum system meant he was able to remain in the country after his application was rejected. The cost of living has surged to its highest rate in almost 10 years. New data reveals that inflation rose to 4.2 per cent in October, mainly due to rising fuel and energy costs. The Consumer Price Index measure of inflation is now more than double the Bank of England's target. The bank says it may have to increase interest rates in the coming months to tackle the problem. Nine Insulate Britain activists have received jail sentences ranging from three to 12 months for breaching a High Court injunction preventing them from blocking roads. The High Court has so far issued five injunctions banning road blocking protests on the M25, around Dover Port and on major London roads. Insulate Britain activist Tracy Malahan spoke outside the Royal Courts of Justice after the sentencing, criticising the government. Your government has now chosen to act and it's chosen to imprison us rather than meet the demand. By imprisoning us, 